Well, happy Mother's Day. My name is Pastor Jared, and I am so excited that you're here today. I'm really excited to preach because I haven't preached a Mother's Day message since 2018. And I got a word for all the moms. Can we give it up for all of our moms in the room watching online? Happy Mother's Day. Happy Mother's Day, Mom. I know you're watching. I know you watch the other service, but I also know you're watching this one too. I'm a mama's boy and I have no shame at all. Uh, but we really are. We are so grateful for each and every one of you. Uh, we wouldn't be the men and women we are today without you. Literally, you are the reason why we're here. And so we just want you to know that we recognize you. We celebrate you. We pray you get all your flowers today uh, in real life and in your heart that you just feel honored. And uh, we're just so grateful. And I, I love that we're in such an amazing church that has incredible mothers, mothers of all ages and stages to be able to see what it looks like to love their children well and to love God. And so one more time, can we just put our hands together for the moms? We'll just stay standing for a few more seconds as we continue our relationship series. I'm excited to bring a word to you out of Luke chapter one about one of the most significant moms in all of biblical history. Her name was Elizabeth. And this is what the Bible says in Luke one, verse five. It says, in the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah who belonged to the priestly division and his wife, Elizabeth, was also a descendant of Aaron. Both were righteous in the sight of God observing all of the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless because Elizabeth was not able to conceive and they were both very old. That should encourage somebody in the room today that you can do all the right things and still walk through some valleys. That bad things happen to good people, but I want you to know the story doesn't end there. God has something on the other side of your struggle. So keep trusting, keep waiting. Because as we jump down to verse 11, it says, then, somebody say then, an angel of the Lord appeared to Zechariah standing at the right side of the altar of incense. And when Zechariah saw him, he was startled and gripped with fear. But the angel said, do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Come on, how many of you claim that over your life today? Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son and you were to call him John. This will be John the Baptist. He will be a joy and a delight to you and many will rejoice because of his birth. He will be great in the sight of God. He is never to take wine or fermented drink. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. Come on, moms. How many of you would be grateful if your babies were filled with the Holy Ghost before they came out of the womb? Look at verse 24, jumping down to the end of the story. It says this, after this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. She isolated herself away, said, I've been waiting my whole life for this moment. Now it's just me and God. She said, the Lord has done this for me. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace amongst the people. Wow, There's a saying when it comes to raising kids and raising a family that it takes a and I really believe that's true, not just in parenting, I think in just being a person. Yeah. It takes a village, come on, to do what God has called you to do, to live in victory. You need people in your life. And we've been on this relationship series and I felt like it was so important to talk about the friendships that God wants to bring into your life to help you bear fruit because you can't do what he's called you to do by yourself. So I wanna preach a message today titled, Don't Steal My Thunder. So as you find your seats, high five three people and tell them, don't steal my thunder. Go ahead and tell three people, don't steal my thunder. Don't steal my thunder, that's mine. How many of you, you've ever been in a season where you just felt like you were killing it? You were crushing it, like in a good way. You were just killing it. Maybe it was in your career, maybe in school, you're getting straight A's, maybe at your job, or maybe just in life, you feel like you're crushing it. And I love those seasons of a winning streak. Come on, don't you love those seasons? You feel like you're killing it until Karen shows up. Come on, anybody got a Karen in their life? Now listen, if your name is Karen here, watching online in the room, I am so sorry, but I did not choose for your name to be used by the global community as the annoying person, okay? Everybody knows what a Karen is, right? Okay, so I apologize to the Karens, but listen, we all got a Karen in our life. You know, Karen, Karen is the person that's the one-up individual. Every time you tell a story, she's got to one-up you. She's got to tell something better. Or maybe everybody's congratulating you for something in your life, but she's the one person that has a criticism. She calls it constructive feedback, right? Because Karen thinks it's her job to keep you humble. That's her responsibility in life. We, 
We all have a Karen. Maybe your mother-in-law is Karen in your life. Maybe your cousin is Karen. Hey, maybe you're Karen, okay? We all got a little bit of Karen on the inside of us, okay? We can all channel Karen from time to time. And no matter how well you're doing, Karen will always one-up you. And so I felt today in a world full of Karens to encourage you and tell you that you're crushing it. You're killing it. Don't let Karen keep you down, man. You're killing it. You're doing better than you think you are. Hit your neighbor and say you're doing better than you think you are. We need some encouragement, man. And whether it's Karen or your career or culture or the computer screen, I think we have a lot of reasons to feel like we're not cut out to do what God has called us to do. The reality is we all struggle with the feeling of inadequacy when our expectations and our experiences do not align. When we expect one thing, our journey to take a certain amount of time, come on, have you ever felt like you were just behind in life? Everybody else is stepping forward. And I've realized that it's not just matching my expectations with my experiences. It's oftentimes when I start comparing myself against others. That's when I find that joy is robbed from my heart. And I slip into that place of feeling insecure, incapable, and inadequate. And if you're a human being in this room today watching online and you got a pulse, chances are at some point in your life, you have felt inadequate and insecure with where you are. And there is no better person to address that emotion than the mother named Elizabeth in scripture. Elizabeth, the Bible tells us in the gospel of Luke, has been struggling with inadequacy her entire life. I did some research on Elizabeth this week, and some theologians believe that she was 88 years old at the time this story was read. That means she spent 88 years struggling with the inadequacy and the insecurity of infertility, watching other women win in her life while she struggled with her empty womb. And for Elizabeth, her burden was barrenness, but you and I have our own burdens of inadequacy. Maybe you feel like you're not as successful as your siblings, or you're not as loved as your siblings. Come on, middle child, where you at? All the middle children unite. Maybe you feel like you're struggling to compete with others in your career, and other people are getting ahead and blazing forward while you feel like you're falling behind. Maybe you feel like you're not as pretty as the other people. You're stuck in your single season and other people are moving forward in relationships. Maybe you're fighting for financial freedom and everybody else around you is being blessed and buying a home. And I don't know who's buying a home right now, but somebody online is somewhere. Come on, moms, what about you? You feel like you give it all you've got, but there's still this feeling like it's never enough. Like you're giving everything that you have to give, but you can still feel inadequate at the end of the day. And I feel like many of us, we feel stuck in the season and the struggle we're in. But if this story tells me anything, it's that your struggle does not define your story. In fact, Elizabeth may have felt inadequate over the years, but all of that misery was just a miracle in the making. And what was once barren became a womb of blessing when God showed up with breakthrough. I came to tell you, you're not stuck. God is just getting started in your life. No matter what season, age, or stage you're in, God has something in store for you. But this sermon, as much as Elizabeth had a reason to celebrate, is not actually about her celebration. Because if you read the story, Elizabeth's celebration was extremely short-lived because Karen was coming. Somebody say, Karen was coming. Look at this. In Luke chapter 1, in the same chapter, in verse 26, it says this. In the sixth month, somebody say the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin, pledged to be married to a man named Joseph. Are you starting to pick up on the story here? A descendant of David. The virgin's name was Karen. I mean Mary. Like, don't talk about Mary like that. In the same chapter, Elizabeth doesn't even get a full chapter without a main character change up. And while Elizabeth has experienced something extraordinary in her old age, it's kind of hard to compete with Mary's miracle. Come on, can we just be real for a second? I know when you read the Bible, you're a little bit disconnected from it, but put yourself in Elizabeth's position, okay? 
Mary's miracle completely upstages Elizabeth's moment. Somebody say, don't steal my thunder. Let's break it down for a second. Elizabeth is 88 years old and has been trying to get pregnant for decades. Mary is age 14 and just accidentally got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Can you imagine what Elizabeth must have felt when a 14-year-old girl, her 14-year-old cousin shows up and she just happened to get pregnant accidentally? Elizabeth is finally with child and not just any child. John the Baptist is in her womb. She is carrying one of the most significant individuals in biblical history, the man who will prepare the way for the Messiah. The spirit of Elijah is gonna be upon him. And Mary is pregnant with Jesus, <laughs> the son of God, the guy who will replace John the Baptist and that her son will get beheaded for. Somebody say, don't steal my thunder. Isn't it crazy how quickly we can go from celebrating what God is doing in our lives to struggling with what he's doing in theirs? So crazy how quick that can happen. How you were so confident, you were feeling yourself. And then you went on social media and you saw that one person in your life that always seems like they've got something better than you've got. And you were feeling great, but all of a sudden, how quickly can it change to where we go from celebrating what God is doing in our lives to struggling with what he's doing in theirs? I think when it comes to relationships and friendships in our lives, many of us are starving for connection, real connection with people who celebrate us and love us and are there for us. And you know why we're starving for connection? It's because we're struggling with comparison. We've fallen into the trap of competition and, and trying to measure up and size everybody else up and see if we can compete with them. Come on, we do this in our lives. Mom, you got your kids out the door in one piece this week. That was a miracle. And then you get online and the mom next door, not only did she get her kids out the door, but she cut their little sandwiches up in little pieces that look like puppies. I can't compete with that. I just, get, at least they're alive and on their way to school. Come on, you helped your fourth grader with their math homework. That was a miracle. Because I don't know if you know this, but they changed math. It's not the same math we had as kids. So you had to research math for four hours to help your fourth grader. And then you go on social media and the mom next door made a science lab for their kid's science project. I can't compete with that. Maybe you got that promotion at work, but your friend launched their 15th business now. Or you accomplished that goal. You finally shed those six pounds. But that person has a 16 pack and it's, I can't compete with that. There's always somebody that's doing it bigger and better. Here's the reality. It's hard to have healthy friendships when you're so focused on who's fastest and who's first who's got more finances, who's better, who's more blessed by God. And I get it, it's hard because somebody is always doing it better and somebody's always doing it bigger. And now with social media, you don't just see the people in your own life, you see people across the world. And we struggle with this comparison issue, but here's what I've realized when it comes to relationships. The God thing in me requires the God thing in you. In order for me to do what God's called me to do, I need you to be who God's called you to be. We need each other. And if we don't have each other, we cannot accomplish in isolation what God has assigned over our lives. And God wants you to have fruitful friendships. I think many of us were crying out for this. And I want people in my life to help me bear fruit and celebrate me when I'm winning and lift me up when I'm losing. But but can I be honest with you? In order to have healthy relationships, we have got to learn how to practice reciprocity. We have got to learn to reciprocate. We, we want everybody to celebrate us. My question is, do you celebrate them? We want everybody to call us, but do you call them? Do you check in on them? Do you celebrate them when it doesn't benefit you? Come on, because we all know somebody that knows how to capitalize an opportunist that figures out, oh, oh, your win could be my win, and so I'll celebrate you when it's convenient for me. But are you willing to celebrate them when it gives you nothing? Yeah. 
to uplift them, maybe when it takes your spot. If you want healthy relationships, you have got to be willing to reciprocate what it is that you long to have in your life. Jesus said this, treat others the way you want to be treated. It was called the golden rule. It was on a banner in kindergarten in our rooms. (laughs) Proverbs 18, 24 says this, a man who has friends must first himself be friendly. Pastor, I got no friends. Are you friendly? Well, nobody talks to me. Well, because you run out of here after church is over, you don't have any conversation with anybody. You never show up to a small group and you're wondering why nobody knows you. You got to put yourself out there. Well, there's no good men. No, where are the godly men? Well, where are the godly women? Where are you at? You got to put yourself out there. If you want to meet a man, You wonder why you don't find no good men because you're looking in the club. You got to get into the house of God and find people where they're supposed to be found. All right, that's not in my notes. I'm not doing that right now. Here's my question for you. Are you dismissing what God sent into your life to develop you? I'll say it like this. Are you cutting out people because you're comparing with them that God actually sent you to help you fulfill your calling? because you need people to accomplish your purpose. You can't do this on your own. And I think if anybody had a reason to refuse somebody in their life, it was Elizabeth with Mary. This was her moment, man. This, This was her season. She'd been waiting for this her whole life. But look at what happens. It says in Luke chapter one, verse 39, at that time, somebody say that time, Mary got ready and hurried to a town in the hill country of Judea where she entered Zechariah's home and greeted Elizabeth. That already annoys me because the Bible says Elizabeth went away into seclusion. That means she didn't want to be bothered by anybody. And little 14 year old Mary, she's all just innocent and naive. I'm going to find where Elizabeth is and I'm going to go to her house. Sometimes I don't want you coming over, okay? I'm by my house, by, in my house by myself for a reason. And yet it says, when Mary shows up, all naive, all excited, with baby Jesus in her womb, it says, Elizabeth heard Mary's greeting. And when she heard it, the baby leapt inside of her, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit. I want to challenge you today to let your spirit determine what you see. Let me ask you this question. When somebody with favor shows up into your life, what rises up on the inside of you? Is it comparison or is it the spirit of Christ? In other words, what do you see in people? You remember when you bought your car and you started seeing that car everywhere? You're like, oh my gosh, I'm a trendsetter. Everybody's been copying me in Elk Grove, getting the same car. Listen, it's not that it wasn't there before. It's that you weren't aware before. You weren't looking for that. And now that you're looking for it, you will find it because you see what you search for. Let's put it in the context of relationships. What do you see in people? Oh, well, they got ulterior motives, Pastor. You don't know. You don't know. I know people. Maybe you see what you're searching for. And because of the struggles and the scars that you have, the enemy has programmed your perspective to only see the negative in people. Come on, we've all been hurt. We've all been a little jaded in our lives. But you control how you see people. Let's talk about how you see your spouse. I know there's a lot to see. And I know that not all of it is positive. But you choose whether or not you want to focus on the God thing in them or you want to focus on the bad thing in them. And listen, I know you know them. I know you know every bad thing in them. But you know what my Bible says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8? It says, finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if there is anything excellent or praiseworthy, think on these things. The scripture says, in the spirit, we now know no man according to the flesh. That means that when I look at you, church, even in your mess and your mistakes, and y'all can be messy sometimes, I do not see you according to your past or your problems. I see you according to the presence of God and the promise of his spirit that's upon you. You're a man or woman of God. 
You got authority and anointing. Do you see your spouse that way? Mamas, do you see your kids that way? I know they're crazy. Come on, anybody got teenage kids? We pray for you. We pray for you. We pray for you. I know that they respond with, I know to everything you say. They think they know more than you in their 13 years of life. And I know it's really easy to see that rebellious attitude. But can I tell you to see according to the lens of the Holy Spirit and see that rebellious attitude is the same thing I had when I was a teenager. And God took that rebellious attitude and turned it into a boldness in the Holy Spirit to bring me to where I'm called to be today. Maybe there's a flip side to that frustration you have with them, but you got to see according to the Spirit. You cannot see according to the flesh. Don't let your history of barrenness make you blind to what God put right in front of you. There is a blessing that God has sent you. And Elizabeth had to see past her flesh, had to see past this annoying little girl who was stealing her moment, and she had to see according to the Holy Spirit. And I wanna challenge you that God has sent some people into your life to provoke some things on the inside of you. And I know you're saying, Pastor, I struggle to see the positive. I get it, I'm the same way. I can tend to be a bit of a pessimist at times. But you know what? God will send people into your life to confront what you think you have under control. You thought you were good at relationships until you got in one. You thought you were a good communicator until your career depended upon it. Come on, you thought you had all this together until somebody was placed into your life and all of a sudden started poking at the problems that you didn't know were there because that's what people do. They poke and God intended it that way. The struggle is a sign that he is sanctifying you and he is adjusting something on the inside of you. Listen, it's easy to be a Christian with your prayer time and your Bible when nobody's around. It's not easy to be that same Christian when your spouse blows in through the door and disrupts you. Anybody can be a Christian monk 24 seven secluded away. That's what Elizabeth wanted. I don't want to be around nobody. I just want to be me and Jesus. And God said, nah, I want to make sure that that thing in you, we adjust that thing. Are you going to compare and compete? Or are you going to see that I sent this person to you to help you fulfill that call on you? Some of you should thank God for your annoying spouse. They annoy you because there's something in you that needs to adjust. And God is using that person to poke and provoke. Proverbs 27, 17 says, as iron sharpens iron. Come on, you don't get sharpened by the caress. You get sharpened by the clash. And sometimes people will clash and confront the things in your spirit that need to be confronted. And it wouldn't happen in any other way unless they showed up. And let me take it a step further. Why is this so important that you allow this to happen? I want to speak to the parents. John the Baptist needs to see Elizabeth honor Mary because one day he would have to submit to Jesus. You are breaking generational curses and you are choosing to set a different example for your children that the way we treat other people is we honor them and we see the best in them. I know my parents raised me a certain way, but I'm gonna change this thing for my kids. I'm gonna teach my children. And that's what Elizabeth was doing, changing the generational line for her children. May not make sense right now, but I, I don't want you to miss out on what God is doing because if he's working in others, that means he's going to work in you as well. But it's one thing to see it. It's a whole nother thing to celebrate it, right? We all know those people that see our posts online, never like them. It's one thing to see it. It's another thing to celebrate it. I want you to see this in verse 42. It says, in a loud voice, this is Elizabeth. She exclaimed, blessed are you among women and blessed is the child you will bear. I'll tell you what, that B word that she starts is probably not the word I would have used if Mary showed up in my house and I'm having my moment. <laughs> Yet Elizabeth says, blessed are you. Blessed is the child you would bear. Why am I so favored that the mother of my Lord would come to me? 
See how she's seeing prophetically? This is why you need the spirit of God to give you prophetic eyes to see people according to the spirit. She says, as soon as you reached my ears, the greeting reached my ears, the baby in my womb leapt for joy. Blessed is she who has believed that the Lord would fulfill his promise to her. Let me challenge you with this. Let your celebration of others make a sound. You cannot celebrate people silently. Well, how many of you, 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 let's just be honest in church. You're a bit of a sore loser. Come on, let's be real. Let's just, you're a sore loser a little bit, okay? Sore losers, I'm kind of a sore loser, but I think that sore losers are far better than bad winners. Y'all know what a bad winner is? The person that has to shove it down your throat every time they beat you, let everybody know how much they won by. I hate bad winners. Bad winners are the people, they know they're good. They know they're the greatest. And so they let everybody know about it. I like to, I like to celebrate the underdog. You know, the humble one that doesn't know they're great. It's the one that knows they're great. I struggle with celebrating them because they celebrate themselves so much. There ain't no more room for us to celebrate you. But here's what I've learned. It's, it's not my job to judge their heart because I don't know what's going on in their life. It is my job to guard mine. Wow. Here's what I've realized. How you celebrate others says a lot about how you see yourself. Wow. Let me say it like this. When you are unable to celebrate others, it reveals what you are unable to believe about yourself. What lie of limitation are you believing about yourself that's stopping you from celebrating others? Come on, how many of us, we, we grew up without a father. I, I lost my dad when I was 11 years old. I understand the struggle of feeling like I'm never enough because I didn't have that voice in my life telling me you're enough, you made it, you're good, I love you, I'm proud of you. Because we grew up as orphans, we believe that we've got to fight for everything we have. We're at a table where the food is limited and you got to get what's yours before somebody else gets it. This is the mindset that we live in, this poverty orphan mindset that we struggle with believing that there's enough to go around. Can I remind you that if you are in the kingdom and you serve your heavenly father, there is more than enough room at the table. There is more than enough food to go around. There's more than enough blessing. And when you know who you are and you are confident as a son or daughter of God, you don't struggle when other people succeed. You celebrate them. But when you're insecure and you're not convinced and confident of your place in the kingdom of God, that's when you begin to believe the lie that you have to take from them because if they're winning, you're losing. Come on, what lie do you believe? That if they're blessed, you gotta be broke? that if they get ahead, you'll fall behind, that if they rise up, that you'll be replaced. Can I tell you what the Bible says? Romans 2, 11, God does not show favoritism. Matthew 5, 45, he causes his son to rise on the evil and the good and sends rain on the righteous and the unjust. Listen, stuff happens, people will succeed and you will feel like you're struggling. It's just a season. Just because God is blessing them doesn't mean he's withholding from you. Stop believing the lie of the enemy and falling into insecurity. This is that older brother syndrome in the prodigal son story. When the younger brother made all the mistakes and he squandered his wealth and he came back home and what was the heart of the father? He ran to his son in the midst of his mess he gave him a robe and a ring and he put sandals on his feet and he killed the fattened calf and he threw a party. And there, where's the older brother? That's you and me. Come on, church folks. That's you and I, because that's the religious spirit. Who does this? I've been serving in church for 20 years. And that guy got promoted. She's preaching. They're being promoted. They're being blessed. They got the new house. They got the child. And what did the father say? He said, everything that is mine has been yours from day one. But because of your religious spirit and your insecurity, you forgot who you are and you forgot who he was. Just because he wandered doesn't mean he stopped being my son. And if you come in here and you judge those who walk in and are lost and you say, well, you shouldn't raise your hands and you don't belong in church, might I submit to you, you've fallen into the religious spirit. Every single person that wanders and comes back home, heaven celebrates and honors and recognizes. God throws a party. 
But the problem is, is that you and I, even as Christians, believe that karma is the currency that we're a part of. You believe in karma and you're a Christian. Karma, where you do good things to earn your upgrade according to your works. You're not a part of a karma system. You're a part of the kingdom system where Christ says this, I gave you an upgrade because I laid my life down and I did the works for you and now you can have it freely. When you realize that everything you have is by the grace of God, you stop judging other people because it's just grace. Somebody say just grace. That's what it is. It's just grace. So we've got to stop comparing. And you know how you kill comparison in your life? You become an encourager. When you become an encourager, come on, we, we all know that person. The one you want to call. The one you want to show. My mom is an encourager. Anything that happens in our life, she's going to throw a party for it. If you've met her, you know it because you feel like she's your mom now. She's been here before. That's just who she is. We all want that person in our life, but are you willing to be that person in their life? Are you willing to call somebody and encourage them, uplift them? You know, we're in this process right now. Look around. The room is packed, right? We need more room. Three services. I'm tired at the end of a Sunday. We've yet to move into this building. It's, it's happening, but it's taking some time. And a buddy of mine, he texted me in Philadelphia, the block church out there in, in Pennsylvania. And he texted me this week. He said, we've got a big announcement. Tune in on Sunday. So I was sitting in my green room right before this service, watching their live stream as they announced that they were given this massive building. And you know what I did? I texted him immediately. He said, I'm watching your church stream and I'm celebrating with you. Why? Because I know that if God did it for you, I know he'll do it for me. I'm not worried about it, but I can genuinely celebrate with you. You know why? Because I want people to do that with me too. And can I tell you that was tough for Elizabeth? And I know that it was tougher because we've walked through our own journey of infertility. We've shared this with you. Years coming on now where we've not been able to conceive a child. And you know what Mother's Day could be? The day where you have to walk on toes around us. We are not those people. Can I tell you, when people come to us just this week that told us that they were pregnant, there is not an ounce of jealousy, frustration, or anger inside of us because we genuinely love you. We genuinely are encouraged by what God's doing in your life. And guess what? God will bless us when it's his time to bless us. But right now, it's your time, baby. And we want to celebrate with you and encourage you. Don't be that type of person that people can't win around. You know what I'm talking about? Those friends that are there when you're losing. Oh, they like you when you're losing because that reminds them that they're better than you. But the moment you start succeeding, they're nowhere to be found. That is not a friend. That is an opportunist. I don't need somebody that's only there when I'm down. I need people that can celebrate me when I'm winning too that can call me up and say, blessed are you. Blessed are you. So how do we do this? We start celebrating people out loud. You can't celebrate silently. You got to say something. So when you see their posts and that thing rises up on you, on the inside of you, wants to compare, kill it by encouraging them. Comment, like it, share it, call them, text them. Kill it by encouraging them. Uplift others. Why does this change the game for us? Because when we're comparing with others, we're focused on what God isn't doing in our lives. And that robs us of joy. But when we're an encourager, we find joy in what God is doing in other people. And can I tell you, when I hear a testimony of Adriana and what God's done in her life, man, I'm encouraged by that. When I hear the baptism stories of what God is doing, man, I'm encouraged by that. I don't get discouraged. I don't start comparing, oh, well, that, what about me? We got to kill that thing. Yeah. You are a part of the family of God. Yeah. He loves you. You are loved. You belong to him. And just because it's not happening right now doesn't mean it's never going to happen. Come on, kill that comparison inside of you by celebrating what others are experiencing. Because when you do this, when you celebrate what God is doing in somebody else, you sow seeds. You're sowing seed that eventually will come full circle. Let's close this story out because you probably didn't see this when you read this story, but I saw it. 
Luke chapter one, verse 56. It says this, Mary stayed with Elizabeth for about three months and then returned home. Let's do a recap real quick. How far along was Elizabeth when Mary arrived? Six months. How long does Mary stay with Elizabeth? How long does that make it? Starting to pick up on it? Here's what that means. Before Mary showed up, Elizabeth in her old age was stuck in isolation with a silenced husband. Because if you read the story, Zechariah didn't believe that the baby was going to come. So God made him mute until the baby showed up. Now, wives, I know you're praying for that over your husbands right now, but (laughs) Elizabeth was not after that, okay? Elizabeth was 88 years old. She needed all the help she could get because if this baby was coming, it was going to break her body. And she was all by herself until Mary showed up. You see, it was the one that Elizabeth could have compared herself to and cut out of her life who ended up helping her complete God's assignment over her life. Why does Luke, the doctor, by the way, tell us that Mary stayed for three months? He wanted to make it explicitly clear that it was at the time that the baby was to be delivered that Mary showed up to her destination and that Mary was not sent to Elizabeth to discourage her, but she was sent to help deliver her baby. But you see, Elizabeth had already been sowing seeds of celebrating Mary's miracle and Mary's moment and Mary's encounter with God. Even though this was Elizabeth's moment, she chose to make it about Mary. And because she saw and celebrated the God thing in Mary, Mary helped deliver the God thing in Elizabeth. Isn't that so good? Can I encourage you today to let what you have sown come full circle? See, as a parent, you're sowing seeds. And I know you don't see it right now. I know they're acting crazy right now. I know, you're, I, know, I know it just feels like you say it and it goes in one ear and out the other. But parents, you're sowing seeds. You're investing into their lives and one day it's all gonna change. I remember the season in my relationship with my mother where it shifted. And maybe those of you who have adult children, you know what I'm talking about, where they never stop being your child, but something changes where you've been sowing and investing and all of a sudden you get that call and they say, I'm so sorry, I had no idea how hard it was and how much you gave and how much you sacrificed. And they begin to bring that seed full circle. You're sowing seeds into your marriage. You're sowing seeds into the people around you. And though you don't see it right now, I want you to know that as you invest by the Spirit of God, those seeds will come full circle. And the people that were sent into your life, you thought might have robbed you of your moment. They didn't rob you of anything. In fact, they were sent to help deliver the God thing on the inside of you. You needed that person to help pull that thing out of you. But what would have happened if Elizabeth cut Mary out of her life? Comparison would have stolen from her what God had sent to her. But if you're struggling to see today, I want to challenge you to sow a seed. I want to close with this passage in 2 Corinthians. It says this, remember, that whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. Whoever sows generously will reap generously. And each of you should give what you've decided to give in your heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to bless you abundantly so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. While he's specifically talking about money here, this is a kingdom principle. Sowing and reaping is not just about finance. It's about investing into your future. And as a kingdom person, you need to know that if you are longing for friends, sow a seed and be friendly. You want somebody to call you? Sow a seed and call them. 
Do you need help? Sow a seed and be helpful. Do you need financial breakthroughs? Sow a seed and invest into God's economy. Do you long for a relationship? Are you single? Sow a seed and serve other people. When you sow seed, that seed will come full circle. Our Bible says this, God will not be mocked. Whatever a man sows, he shall reap. What that tells me is this, you make a mockery of God if you don't believe you could sow in faith and not reap a harvest. And he will not be mocked. He is a good father. And no man can stop the seed that you have sown in the spirit. You say, well, pastor, I I invested and they just squandered it. They walked away. You weren't sowing in that person. You were sowing into the spirit in that person. And while they may not reward you, God will. While they may not give back to you, God will. So trust God and allow him to be the rewarder of those who diligently seek him. But you, you sow seed. And I wanna close with this thought because we started with this idea, of the sermon title, Don't Steal My Thunder. But I was thinking about thunder this week. You know what thunder really is? Thunder is just a sound. It's a sound of something that's a greater source somewhere else. And I think we've bought into this idea that I've got to protect my thunder because that, that's mine. But thunder is just a sound of a greater source. And if God is sounding blessing in my life, I don't want to guard that from others. I want to give that away. If there's a sound of blessing in my life, let me let you know that it's gonna, lightning's gonna strike right over there. If God did it in me, he can do it in you. So let my life be an encouragement. Let my life be generously given away. That if God did a work in me, my friend, he wants to do it in you as well.